It was a cold, stormy night, just the perfect atmosphere for such a spooky mission, I thought, while riding my scooter toward the abandoned building through the nearly empty streets in the middle of the night. I hadn't told anybody what I was going to attempt that night, not even my girlfriend. I had to choose that particular night as it was the only night my girlfriend would stay at her parents to assist her mother after a delicate surgery. It's now or never. I remember saying to myself. So I had packed my backpack with things and gadgets that could be useful for my mission. Among other things, a couple of military-grade flashlights, night vision goggles, a combat knife, an emergency medical kit, my action camera, my smartphone, a power bank, my vintage Polaroid camera, so I would probably still be able to snap a few photos in case electronics wouldn't work on the other side, and lots of snacks, protein bars, and water. I really didn't know what to expect for that night, so I tried to be prepared for any possible outcome, including getting stuck in that place for more than just a few hours. When I arrived in front of the building, the area looked simply spectral. I parked my scooter nearby, left my helmet on the scooter seat, and headed towards the building's main entrance, looking around and making sure nobody saw me entering. Once inside, I took a flashlight from my backpack and started walking to the lobby and the elevator. There were no lights working in the building apparently, and the elevator was probably the only thing still connected to the power grid. It was actually weird, now that I think of it. But that night I had already more than enough to occupy my mind, so I surely wouldn't focus on the small details. I recall being truly frightened and constantly on alert, being in that dark and deserted place all alone while a storm raged outside with mighty thunders and frequent lightnings. It really felt like being in a horror movie, like one of those slasher films. Anyway, I got to the entrance of the elevator and pushed the button to call it to the lobby floor. I watched the floor display panel above illuminating each floor number as it counted down from 10 to L, which stood for lobby. The elevator's car clunked to a halt, and, after a second or two, its sliding doors opened slowly, with the usual ding sound. I felt my heart sink for a moment. Before stepping into the elevator car, I carefully inspected its interiors. It was just as I had first seen it in Jake's selfie. There was no elevator music playing or anything like that. Just a soft yellowish light coming from an old overhead neon lamp and a mild stench, like its walls were impregnated with old cigar smoke. The neon lamp kept on flickering at irregular intervals. I took out my small notebook from my pants side pocket and opened it at the bookmarked page, where I had written down the two combinations of floors that would allow me to respectively get to the other side and return to our reality hopefully together with my friend Jake. The guys in the dark web forum had given me precise instructions and prepared me for different likely outcomes. The floor number combinations were specific for reaching the same alternate reality where Jake had likely ended up. As it turns out, there are different combinations for reaching different alternate realities. Just a very few of them have been explored so far. They also gave me one extra set of floor number combinations, which I wrote on the very last page of my notebook, so as not to possibly confuse these with the main set of combinations that I needed to access Jake's specific reality. The extra set of floor combinations had to serve as an emergency measure, one I hoped I would never have to implement. In an unfortunate scenario where I were unable to return to my home reality, I could use the emergency combination to travel to yet another alternate reality one that's been nicknamed Monochrome City by the Dark Web Forum participants. It seems it's some kind of pocket universe where a special black ops military force has been operating in secret for decades. They maintain an active base of operations in there for reasons and purposes which are unknown. The military have built an entire city in that pocket universe, and civilian personnel also live there on a permanent basis mostly scientific and technical personnel and their families. The entire pocket universe looks black and white to the naked eye, like an old TV set, hence the nickname Monochrome City. A long time ago, an amateur interdimensional explorer stumbled upon Monochrome City by pure accident, and eventually, the military helped him cross back to our home reality. 
So, that would be my own backup plan, too. With my notebook open in my hands, I entered the elevator car, took a deep breath, and proceeded to push the first floor button in the sequence. The number three. The sliding doors closed, and the elevator car started ascending. When it reached the third floor, the sliding doors opened, revealing a scary, dark, silent corridor outside, then they closed again and I pressed the second button in the sequence, the number two. I went on to complete the sequence as instructed. From the second floor, I went to the seventh, then to the third again, then to the fifth, then to the ninth, to the seventh again, and finally, to the tenth floor. This was a critical point in the sequence. If the procedure had been performed correctly, the sliding doors had to remain shut and the elevator car had to automatically start traveling down to the lobby level, then up again to a mysterious unmarked floor located between the 12th and the 14th, where I had to finally gain access to the alternate world where supposedly Jake had ended up stuck. But from that point on, things didn't continue as expected. On the 10th floor, the elevator car stopped, its doors did remain shut, but then it went up to the 11th floor, where it stopped, and the sliding doors opened and closed quickly. Then, faster than normal, down to the ninth floor, where the same thing happened with the doors. Then again even faster up to the fourteenth floor, and finally, slowly down to the unmarked floor, where the elevator sounded its usual ding, and its doors slid open. All I could see outside the elevator was absolute pitch black, and a dead silence. The air coming from outside the elevator was much colder than the air inside. And it had a particular smell, like in hospitals or something like that. Meanwhile, the elevator doors stayed open, but I couldn't figure why. In the excitement of the situation, I had totally forgotten to take my action camera out from the backpack, and I hadn't recorded anything up to that point. So, after observing that black void for a couple of minutes... I decided to start filming. Unfortunately, I found out that not only the camera but all the electronics I had brought with me were already dead, including the night vision goggles. I took the Polaroid then and tried to snap a photo. But that too was a failed attempt. I struggled not to panic and to remain as lucid as possible. I had to think. I wasn't sure how to proceed from there. The original sequence of floors had obviously been broken, as some other force had seized control of the elevator, or maybe a glitch caused it to interrupt the combination. In any case, I surely wasn't where I was supposed to be, so I decided against exiting the elevator. I also realized the other obvious problem. If I started the return combination from that floor, the elevator wouldn't take me back to my home reality but rather to some other alternate reality. There was only one thing left to do. I reached for my pocket and took out my small notebook, the one where I had written down all the sequences, and I quickly browsed it up to the very last page. The special emergency sequence to access Monochrome City had been designed to work under any circumstances and from any floor, independently from any previous combination of floors. Except one small rule. The sequence was 1743171314. The instructions given to me said that if I happened to be on a floor that contains the number 1, I had to switch the first two digits of the combination between them. As I was on the 13th floor, although unmarked, I figured it counted anyway as containing the number 1. So I changed the sequence accordingly. 71431713144 The sequence was supposed to work only once it had been entered precisely and in its entirety. I carefully started inputting the sequence in the elevator keypad all at once, as instructed, when suddenly I heard noises coming from the dark void outside. Very faint indistinct sounds at first, but then they began to quickly grow into louder and more distinct noises with each passing second and they sounded more and more like a mix of approaching footsteps and human voices, like a group of people running towards me from a relatively great distance, shouting things at one another. I couldn't help but panic. Moreover, I couldn't remember which was the last digit I had entered into the elevator keypad. 
I tried to stay focused and began entering the combination again from the first digit. The noises grew closer and closer. I thought I could make out some English words, but I wasn't really sure at that point. Halfway through the combination, I realized I hadn't switched the two digits at the beginning. I started over. Now I could clearly hear people running, approaching fast. No more shouting, though. Just a group of people running towards me. I had no idea what was going on, who those people were, or what their intentions were. Assuming they were actually people. Anyway, I had no interest in finding out. I just wanted to get my ass out of there before they arrived, whoever they were. I quickly finished entering the emergency sequence into the elevator keypad and with my back pressed against the mirror, I waited for the doors to finally slide shut. After what seemed like an eternity, the doors began to slowly slide. The group sounded really close now, although I couldn't tell how close. But when the doors were half closed, something happened. A bright white light suddenly flooded the whole space outside the elevator. While the elevator doors were shutting, I could catch a quick glimpse of what was beyond. It looked like an immense warehouse interior of some sort. I couldn't see where it ended. Everything was white, and there were metallic-looking grids, like scaffolding, as tall and as far as I could see, and encased in that metal structure were these glass boxes or cages, an infinity of them, like cubes, each one maybe six feet on every side. There were countless rows of those glass cubes, stacked on top of one another. And I saw things moving inside all the cubes, living creatures, like people or animals, but I couldn't really tell what they were. The last thing I saw before the elevator doors got fully shut was this group of 20 to 30 men in yellow hazmat suits, some holding some kind of silvery weapons or technical instruments, all running like mad towards the elevator, one of them with his arm extended in an attempt to insert his hand between the closing doors to keep the elevator from departing. Fortunately for me, none of them was fast enough. The doors closed, and the elevator started its descent. I was frightened and shocked. They didn't sound friendly, that's for sure. I had no idea what I had just witnessed, or what they wanted from me. But there was no time to think. The elevator was hopefully taking me to a place where somebody could help me return home. Once the elevator completed its new sequence on the fourth floor, the doors remained shut, and the cabin started ascending until it reached the same unmarked thirteenth floor again. Thank God! When the doors opened this time there were no crazy angry men in yellow hazmat suits waiting for me. The hallway outside the elevator was well lit, and, as I had been told, my eyes perceived everything in monochrome there. It was like watching an old black and white film that had been remastered. There was nobody out there. It was eerily quiet. I grabbed my backpack from the elevator's floor and confidently enough stepped outside. The doors closed behind my back, and I heard the elevator car leaving that floor. I then noticed there were no buttons to call the elevator back to the floor. But it made no difference, since there was no safe place where the elevator could have taken me now, and surely not home. Monochrome City was my only hope. The hallway was so long I could see where it ended in either direction. I picked one direction and started walking. There were no doors and the whole corridor was basically like a large, smooth, gray plastic tube. There were white neon lights on the ceiling, like in a highway tunnel, and a white dash median strip painted on the floor, which ran all along the hallway's length. After walking for something like 30 minutes with no end in sight, I started hearing a buzzing noise coming from behind. I turned around but at first, I couldn't see anything, while that buzzing was growing louder and louder. Something was approaching fast. After a few seconds, I could finally see a white object in the distance, which looked bigger and bigger the closer it got. I had no place to hide, so I just stood there and waited. And I didn't have to wait long. Just ten seconds or so, and this white vehicle of some kind, resembling a giant egg, slowed down and came to a stop a few feet in front of me. The buzzing also stopped and the vehicle maintained its position, levitating a foot from the ground. 
It dawned on me I wasn't in the hallway after all, but in a road tunnel designed for those egg-shaped fast vehicles, hence the dashed white median strip on the pavement. Then, after a few more seconds, without making a sound, an oval opening just appeared on the right side of the vehicle and a figure emerged, clearly a young woman, clad in a tight, futuristic-looking, smooth white military tactical suit. With an effortless grace, she stepped out onto the pavement, her white boots making contact with the ground in near silence. I was stunned when she removed her helmet, 